Welcome to the Picture Booking Podcast, a show that celebrates children's books by chatting with those who make them. Today's feature book, Best Believe the Tres Hermanas, A Sisterhood for the Common Good, can be pre-ordered with a release date of February 6, 2024. Nonika Ramos beautifully wrote this story in rhythmic verse, and we can't wait for you to dive into her conversation with host Nadia Salomon after these messages. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this edition of Picture Booking Podcast. I'm your guest host, Nadia Solomon, sitting in for Nick Patton. And today I am super excited to welcome Nonika Ramos to the show. And we have a lot to talk about because she has a new book um, due out soon, and it's called Best Believe. And I will let Nonika take it away. Tell us a little bit about the book. First, thank you so much for having me. I, I enjoy uh, all of your uh, podcasts and posts just as a reader. Thank so thank you. you. Yeah, so Best Believe um, is a story inspired by three sisters, the Tres Hermanas from the Bronx. I came upon this um, idea for this story when I was searching the internet during the pandemic. And I'm, I'm not sure how I ended up down a rabbit hole, but I ended up at Casita Maria, which is in the Bronx. And I saw that there was an event uh, from one of the Tres Hermanas and I saw a mural of all three and they were smiling. And I was so compelled because I didn't know who they were. I, I, I grew up in the Bronx and I had no idea who they were. <laughs> so, um, I did some quick research and the more that I looked, the more fascinated I became with these pioneers, um, with these community activists, with these in, this incredible family. Um, so the Tres Hermanas is a book about these three sisters, their relationships and, and all of the incredible things that they've done um, for the Bronx, for New York and, and, and for the country that I thought every kid should know. It's an incredible story and they each have uh, different paths. And um, in, in reading the story, I loved how um, the story was broken down because you tell three stories and then it intersects and becomes one. And then it becomes the reader's story. So can you tell us a lo little bit about the thought process that went behind how to tell um, their story? Well, as you can imagine, um, <laughs> with with the challenges that everyone faces when they write a picture book, it's very complicated. Um, and so this book went through a multitude, a multitude of, of drafts before I found the right way in. Um, I have never written a picture book bio before, you know, so when I stumbled upon these three sisters and I was shocked at my own ignorance at not knowing these incredible humans who are basically next door, um, I asked myself, am I ready? You know, who's going to tell the story, right? Somebody needs to tell the story. And, and, and we all know how that goes. Like I, right. I it, that would, that was me. I was like, Oh, you have to tell the story. And I felt really ill-equipped. Um, I wrote my first draft in prose. Um, it was like a billion words long. Um, it was absurd. It was ridiculous. And so um, I sought mentorship. And so Monica Brown, you know, the PB bio queen, as far as I'm concerned, <laughs> agreed to take me on and read through my work. And she said to me, uh, the words that guided me through, she said, what your issue is, is you haven't found the door yet. What is the doorway in? Right. Yeah. So as you, as you said, so perfectly, um, this, these, each of these three sisters could have had a book. Um, I had to kind of find the intersection, which is their relationships. These three sisters adored and loved each other. And the idea of writing about sisters, sisterhood and sisters, um, in itself was super interesting. Mm -hmm. Um, and then the second thing that brought me home to finding how to tell it was the voice, mm -hmm. because I thought, um, does this need to be in rhyme, right? They don't always have to be in rhyme. I didn't start this book in rhyme, but then I thought, you know, if Evelina Antonetti, who has passed, 
um, and was the matriarch in many ways were here, I would want to hear her voice. She was something. She was just something else. And so um, I wanted to capture that spirit, that verb, you know, just of her, of the sisters of the Bronx, of their activism. And so that's when I ended up back into the the prose, uh, excuse me, the uh, poetry that people are familiar with when they, they read my work. Um, yeah, and so here we are. Um, I have a great editor, Carol Hintz, um, who also guided me through the process. But I do think awesome. that, yes, it, yes, she's amazing. And so I think that, uh, first of all, she's brave because we have to remember she took this on <laughs> um, as well. But anyway, yeah, I don't, I, I nodded. The answer is just a lot of work. I mean, you you know uh, how that is. The final product is not indicative of all the things that went through it and a lot of learning. So I guess what I want to say to any writers who are listening, who are maybe pre-published, like that's always the case. We're always um, working and struggling and trying to find the right way to tell a story, especially if we are honoring people who are have made great accomplishments and and I'm certainly very well aware that I I, um, I have to do their story justice. Yeah, because there's a lot of um, responsibility and care and um, thoroughness with research that you have to do to tell the story. This actually came up um, during the picture book summit that I attended um, with Julie Headland and and um, the team behind uh, the picture book summit and they were talking to her and Angela Dalton about you know the eight taboos <laughs> of picture book writing <laughs> what you don't want to fall into and that was one that was super important because a lot of times people assume that when you're writing that story you're enamored with the person and you overlook their flaws but you know when you are retelling their story or the good of their story to children um while it's important to be honest about the flaws and the reality of the world but you know it the work that they did still speaks up and so that's what the focus of your story ends up being and um picture book writing is not for, uh, I'm, I'm sorry picture book uh, picture bio writing is not for the faint of heart let alone picture book writing <laughs> So yeah. I hear you on that, like, where do I begin? Well, whose story do I tell first, right? And then to decide um, how you eventually lay it down. And then it's not just the way that you wrote it with like the poetry and the lyricism and even some of the rhyme. Like I, I, I noticed some rhymes like throughout the manuscript, but I also loved how, um, you know, you have a through line, like, you know, believe, best believe. And then there was one line that stuck out at me in particular, where you said that like hunger doesn't take a vacation. I mean, that that was so, I don't know, eye opening for me in a way to, to read that line, because it felt visceral for me. So when you were writing this, like, how did you end up, you know, coming up with those kinds of through lines? You, you know, you've said so many things that have just set off these lights. And my, I, so a, a couple of things in the storytelling. One of the things that I you brought me back to was balance. Evelina Antonetti is a towering figure. Um, she's a towering figure in New York and Bronx history, but also to her sisters. Her sister Elba is uh, 93. She is um, living. She's living in Co-op City. And all you hear from her is how much she adores her sisters to the point where she effaces herself, you know? So the, mm -hmm. one of the challenges was to create balance and to show children that it's the support of each other, um, even with towering figures, even with powerhouse people, it really, when it comes down to it, it's our, it's our siblinghood that is going to make us shine, you know? So the through line for me was one of balance and the more that I excavated because I got to interview Elba and because of her, this book is um, as, as I feel like as strong as, as it can be. Um, she illuminated things about her contributions unknowingly. She tried really hard not to take credit for anything. <laughs> so I think, um, you know, the through line being the balance, the through line being the sisterhood, the through line being community, um, because I think that when we're, when you were talking about, well, we want to make sure we're presenting kids with the best, what's the actions that speak louder, you know, than, than anything else in, in their lives. 
I also um, wanted to make what they did accessible. And I think a lot of kids can think, you know, I have um, community, friendship, family, um, people in my life that can support the things that I'm passionate about because as amazing as Evelyn is, and she is phenomenal, um, you know, the people who were making the, those things that she was doing possible were people like Elba, who was doing so much stuff that wasn't necessarily as glorious looking, but was like this book says, holding it down and making sure that these kinds of things are possible. So the through line being the, the community and, and making sure that I think with any big figures in history, because you know, you're so right, PP bio is a little, ter- a little bit terrifying to write. <laughs> With any amazing, towering figures in history, if we just dig a little, we're going to find out that those things were possible because there were people beside them, behind them, but likely beside them, helping them through. So that's one of what was one of my goals to achieve. And one of the things that um, Monica Brown and Carol Hintz helped steer me to do. And how do you feel about this? version that is being published versus maybe one other draft that you may have had is there anything that you left out or you wished were in the book that didn't quite make it (laughs) i got it i got into so much trouble because the back matter was also like 90 billion pages long um so i cheated i cheated everybody this is what i did because yes there is so much stuff on these sisters that I I really could have written multiple books. And in fact, I'm thinking of writing other books based on the people they knew people like, you know, uh, just read the book. You'll see, (laughs) but, um, the book's amazing, by the way, it's, it's, so (laughs) thank you, Nadia. (laughs) Here's how I cheated. Um, I said to to Carol, I said, so what do you think about having the additional uh, back matter? And Carol said, you know, we can do that by um, creating a QR code on the book and it's on my website. So if you do the regular back matter, which has vocabulary and lovely pictures and a timeline um, and you go to the QR code, that extra stuff that I couldn't, I couldn't live without is actually on my website. So, and even that's not all of it. So there's a treasure trove here for readers, um, writers who are interested in what's research like, um, readers, children to, to, to sift through um, so much history and you're going to dig in there and find out that these these women are connected to so many other famous, incredible um, people of color. Um, that is just amazing to think, right? When you think about the world that all these incredible souls are around us and have been have been doing work on our behalf for a while. Yeah, that's what's really um you know, eye-opening sometimes, like you don't realize uh, the privilege that you have or that you enjoy, like the sacrifices that went into having said privileges. For example, um, you know, I'm going to go into the, fa- my, one of my favorite spreads out of the, the, the book was um, Elba's page where she's, ha- she's standing in between the pages of all the books or, or not the pages, but like the, the, um, Lillian, the yes. Binding. The, the binding. Oh, sorry, not Elba, Lillian. Um, she was standing there and she had the key in her hand. And for me, that felt like such um, a p- empowering uh, visual. And I want us to talk a little bit about the art because the art also um, fills in a lot of the emotion and it also... I don't know, maybe this is me just because like, you know, my family's from the island. So like it captures also the colors of Puerto Rico, right? So tell us a little bit about that. Talk to us a little bit about um, the art. Nicole. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So I agree with you that page is profound. Um, The Mm -hmm. books that Nicole Medina drew um, on the page as you're speaking, I'm I'm going to the the end of the book um, just to kind of remind ourselves of this yeah and the titles here. and the titles that she selected were, were like um there's a reason for it so i want yes. you to tell us about that yes yes so one thing that's amazing is nicole is it is an artist this is her first picture book and so this was an incredible journey that we both went on um for her um to to have this space to to tell the story in with her art medium because i think the best picture books are are there's a collaboration, 
And there's also a place where each individual's art takes off. And the color that you talked about, the palette, is one of the things that I loved about Nicole Medina's work before this book began when we were looking at her portfolio. Um, it's just gorgeous the way she works with color mm -hmm. and textiles and patterns. Um, and if you look at the book, every single outfit that the right. um, that I said Manas are wearing, she researched at, through photographs and through mm -hmm. talking with Elba. So it was a, her collaboration also with Elba to make sure that she was capturing this fashion, the spirit, because guess what? Like part of life is not only their activism, but just they were dynamic and, mm -hmm. and, and Evelina was known as gorgeous and fashionable and she used to be known for wearing beautiful hats and little things like that. Nicole, as you said, brought in the emotional resonance, right? Of, of mm -hmm. those moments, um, the page with the staircase, really, I thought. Yes. And that page mirroring Evelina leaving um, the island, you know, on the steamship. I mean, I mm -hmm. think she really brought so many things thematically, thematically together. But the other thing I want to point out is this. Look at the skin tones. Mm -hmm. If you look in there, I, I am so just in awe of how she was able to capture the multitude of skin tones of the people of color in the book. And it was important to Elba because uh, the, the three sisters did not look exactly the same. Right. And she, right. Nicole captured those differences. So she, she really um, captured so many nuances. And I think that that can be the biggest challenge um, to, in creating a, a, any book, obviously, mm -hmm. but with a picture book bio is to capture all of those things. Um, yeah. in the book to make sure that we are, really creating well-rounded humans. So when a kid goes through the pages or a teacher goes through the pages, sure, I definitely want them to see Shiro's. Mm -hmm. Of course I do. But I also want kids to see these are people who are in many ways just like them. These are people who had their own interests, their own passions, you know, and um, and I also just want them to be drawn to flipping the pages. Some kids read just by looking at the pictures and they don't read the words. Right. So, yeah, I um, Nicole's... And I are, are excited. We'll be collaborating together to do an unboxing as soon as they come. We can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> that is so exciting. I have to say, like going back to what you were saying about, um, you know, sometimes just flipping through the pages because I was able to scroll through the pages because I, I read the digital arc and um, the pages that really stood out at me were definitely the voyage scene because I, I found that to be a, a very magical way that she illustrated and 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 com I don't want to say compartmentalized, but that's what it felt like. The emotion in each of those scenes, kind of mm -hmm. like, you know, the ship alone to the unknown, and kind of like you know the kid with the suitcase taking that step because she's leaving her family behind, you know, for the first time, and and just going it alone. And um, for people who have relatives who came to this country um first or who aren't you know american born like myself like you like she captured that scene so well because people don't realize the trauma that goes with like all those feelings because it, sometimes the people who are left behind feel abandoned and i thought the pictures uh, captured that really well and so in your conversations with them did you ever have a moment where you talked to each of them about what it was like when, um, you know, Evelina left first? Yeah, so my conversations with, were, were with Elba. Um, Elba is brilliant. And walking into her home in Co-op City was like walking into a museum. <laughs> and you can spend hours there just listening to her story tell about history that is in every crack and crevice of her of her home. And as you sit there, people come in that amaze you um, as well, because she's connected, she's connected to so many incredible activists. And and, and um, so when I talked to Elba, I, I tried to ask questions, um, you know, that let, let her talk in an open ended way. Elba saw the first um, strongest draft when I had moved from um, prose to the poetry. And she did not like it. I can tell you that it was <laughs> terrifying and a little bit hilarious, but also just 
my heart stopped <laughs> because um, and speaking about how this came about, like I thought, oh, well, I've captured things perfectly because I'm, I'm, I called it royalty back then. And I thought mm -hmm. this is an ironic way of talking about royalty, right? Mm -hmm. and, and she, in her uh, response to me, said, we need to meet because I need to dispel a few notions for you. Um, right. Yeah. <laughs> because I know she so, does not like that, right? <laughs> no. So we met. And, and she said, let me explain to you why there's, there's a difference between fact and myth. And I want to tell you about, yes, people called, um, yes, people do call us Bronx royalty. And that, that is true. Um, but let me explain to you how I feel about that. And most especially how Evelina felt about that in any and all, you know, no uncertain terms. And so I thought, wow. So I had to go back to, um, you know, drafting because of course, again, we're honoring the, the people who were talking, mm -hmm. telling the stories about um, and in those discussions and in those interviews, um, this is where, uh, excuse me, where Elba shared things that are nowhere else, um, you know, as far as the, the many, many things I researched, they add little additions by listening to her that I thought, wait, I need to explore more. So I think part of research is listening, um, being corrected. Um, and also for those of us who are writing about people who have passed, right? Because I, I could hear the questions of what, what am I supposed to do when I'm reading things and not putting words in their mouth. I think that that's a really big danger in picture book by writing. If you see my book, you're going to actually see sections that are in Evelina's own words. They're not my words. I wrote around them. Um, you know, and because I thought, well, I, I'm not going to say this better than her. And I'm also not going to ever assume that I would know what Evelyn Anthony was going to say about anything. <laughs> so, and Elba. So after I got through um, having these great discussions with her, talking to my editor and saying, hey, we have to go back in here because um, this is, this is not, it's not, it's not good enough. It's not ready. And, and having Carol say, then it's not. And let's, what do we, you know, what needs to be done as far as me as the writer, um, her, her as the editor. She, Carol gave me that space and room to go back in. And I think that that's, you know, when you're speaking about, I don't know if I'd use the word privilege, but I, I do feel the gift of having an editor that is so supportive of, um, you know, me as, as a BIPOC person, as, as a Puerto Rican person, as a queer person, not just that she took my story in, but she gave me the time to make sure that I, um, as I said earlier, that I gave it justice. And I'm, I'm hoping all editors are doing that out there because it's not just about supporting Viper people. It's not just about you bought a couple of books. It's it's a journey. I had to rewrite it. And then I gave it to Elba and then we got a thumbs up. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> now, how important is that um, to you um, as an author to have a supportive editor like Carol? Because I know for me, when I wrote Goodnight Ganesha, it was extremely important to tell our story accurately because it was lived experience. And so, you know, what does it mean to you when you do have an editor like Carol who supports you and allows you that? And it, and you know, it's not just a quota. I feel in so many ways, um, I'm, like I'm sure every, many of us feel, you know, that Publishing is so inherently flawed. This is the system that that we're that we're trying our best to maneuver in. And you know, when a system is is, is this flawed, I feel it is absolutely pivotal. Like in in my writing career, my development as a writer that I that I've had an editor like Carol and and, it, and my first editors were from Learner. So my first um, YA novel, Disturbed Girls Dictionary, was Amy Fitzgerald, and she is just the same. And so this is a special um, learners, just really amazing in that way. And so I don't think that's happening everywhere. I do not. I do think that a lot of those persons who are editors um, of color, they are, are so many obstacles are put in their path mm -hmm. that they struggle to do what they are passionate about doing. I mean, we know this by listening to the stories. So I, um, I will always um, hope that you know, she and I um, can continue to work on projects. And I do know um, that through the pandemic, especially when publishing you know, basically shut down and we know how hard it is when it's open, yeah. <laughs> right? Even when, even when you're an established writer, even if you've got accolades, you know, 
it's still a struggle. At least I find it that way. So yeah, it's amazing. Um, I think that if let's say um, I wasn't working with Carol, I worry that I might have been pushed or nudged to work faster than this story ne needed. Um, yeah, so it is it is vital. But that being said, I understand that a lot of us are like, we don't have that choice. That's not always the case. Mm -hmm. We have to do the best with what we're finding. And I completely respect, always respect that because I know we're all in the struggle together. And now overall, how long did it actually take you to write this story from concept to publication? Hmm. I pushed myself to start working on this um, as soon as that idea came, because sometimes I think when I'm terrified of something, I don't want to jump right off <laughs> right away and and not sit in that terrible, okay, let's go give it a try. We, you know, and I, <laughs> I started researching right away. So that was in the pandemic. And that would have been in the very beginning, probably after the shutdown, which was what, April? Well, no, it was March, March 11th. For March. March 11th, 2020. I will never forget. <laughs> yes. I'm so, Yes. Yes. So I, this was very soon after that. So I would say I was starting to work on the concept then. So, I mean, think about it. It's now coming out February, 2024. Um, I was just making tweaks on certain things um, because I think with a story that, that encompasses so much history, I'm always super sensitive to making sure that I am, like you were saying earlier, presenting what really happened, but doing it as a, in a sensitive way as possible. There are some things in there, like the way kids used to be treated in classrooms that if you you are reading as an adult the historical um you know archives is just horrifying how do you tell the kids <laughs> you know it was um, still cringeworthy by the way um yes because that was also part of my experience in school <laughs> so yeah so it's like i don't want to write I, I and then and that's not who i am anyway anyone who right. reads my work i'm gonna write it but it uh, to be delicate about that took time mm -hmm. and to make sure and and the issue is i did not um you know the way that i grew up was in many many ways just problematic homophobic just mm -hmm. uh ableist it's just the way yeah. that everything around me was so i have to like okay am i doing this in a way that's going to make people feel like they're empowered and i think that's the whole thing about telling true history telling accurate history, all the issues with those who are trying to ban books on true history. Mm -hmm. We 110% can tell the facts, the truth, and progress forward in a way in which we all feel empowered and we all feel that we can progress forward together. It is possible. And I think that that's, that's hey, that's the big challenge of, of in particular writing picture book bios. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also the joy. I, I want to point that out. It's like, I can't tell you how excited I am that I got to write this. Like I got to, me? <laughs> Who am I to tell this story? I never in my wildest dreams, you know, as a younger person or even as an adult thought I was honestly, honestly good enough to, to, to write a bio. I just thought that's not for me, <laughs> you know? And so, you know, I, I definitely took my time with it. Um, but there's some, there's an incredible gift. Um, and I say that with each other, I don't say that people are gifting us the opportunity. We should have as many as, as, mm -hmm. as everybody else has, but I'm just saying, I realize that these women are incredible and, 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 and I got to do this. And then because of that, I get to reach out to other kids and, and help them and tell them, yes, you do have icons. They have been here. You haven't seen them in the books, just like I didn't see yeah. these women. In, and I was like a like family in Co-op City. That's where Elba lives. I, I might have passed by her door, wow. you know? Yeah. <laughs> so um, yeah, these people have always been here. Our accomplishments, um, these phenomenal people who were living their lives on behalf of, of, of their families and their communities, as well as for their private joys. We've been here this whole time. And no matter how difficult the story is, and when older readers dig and they find it, wow, it really was challenging. They're still going to know on the other side of that, look at what, look at what they did. Look at all these things yeah. that they did. Um, and look at all the things that we are capable of doing, especially when we're all really scared and really overwhelmed. 
about the state of things. I imagine that those Tres Hermanas were feeling that same way when the Bronx was burning, <laughs> you know? Yeah. yeah. I mean, they're unsung heroes. There are people who actually, um, you know, fr from reading the story, um, they took action when others did not. And it wasn't because, you know, someone was pushing them to do it. It was just something innate. So it's kind of like you reading their story, finding out about them and going, whoa, like th these are people in my community, right? That no one ever talks about. And so I feel like you were probably compelled because you're like, this is my neighborhood as well. And these are people yeah. that I should have known about, but didn't. But now you're taking that opportunity in doing it, in telling their story in the picture book that you're going to be sharing with people soon. So someday you're going to tell other stories. So this is your first PB bio, but I'm sure, you know, I expect to see more PB bios or, you know, <laughs> other kinds of stories that relate to um, that. Wow, I didn't know that happened in my community. And I think that's what um, makes this book amazing to see you talk about all those experiences that even I myself, I'm like, you know, who are these other unsung heroes in our communities that, that, you know, we should be talking about so that our kids can see themselves reflected in these stories or to feel empowered. Yeah. And I think one of the things that, that really um, is so inspiring about these three sisters is they all did it their own way. There isn't one way. Evelina was out there protesting, creating an organization. You know, William is a librarian who was doing her activism in the libraries through literature, through community outreach. You know, Elba was managing the operation on many, many fronts. And so there are just so many different ways that I hope that kids and adults, because again, I always keep those adults who didn't have these kinds of books um, when, when they were young. Um, as much as I do the the kids, as you said, who 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 we want to never look and back to the child and say I didn't have that. We want them to say I can tell you all about those things. So yeah, um, I, there there are so many different ways that we can all feel not overwhelmed. You know, we have to consider the mental health of our kids. Sometimes it's it's very overwhelming to only create these icons that seem unattainable. No, these are these are accessible stories these are women who have done attainable things and there are there's not just one way so that's the way i think that i tried to make sure that um our, our little ones the ones who are sensitive our teens our middle schoolers who are oh they feel the weight of the world on them so so many of them do so that's we want to make sure when we're right making our pv bios that that's when they leave the book they're feeling like it's gonna be okay <laughs> We're in it together. And what was the biggest learning curve for you writing this PB bio, would you say? The biggest learning curve? Um, that's an interesting question, Nadia. <laughs> Not to put you on the spot or anything. <laughs> no, I, I, do, I do think um, the research was new for me, obviously for your mama and Peter up there, those are, those are different art forms. Mm -hmm. So, uh, learning how to account to bring all of that research the piles of it together um and and to distill that into the kernel of the story you're trying to tell um i that was challenging for me because i definitely went off in many different directions um in trying to do that and i know that one of the the requirements of being a pb writer is to be economical right we have to let the artwork as you were saying so astutely it has to have a large place in the narrative, right? So yes, that was it. But when I look back at that journey in the different versions and trying to to whittle it down, but yet yeah, whittle is the right word, right? Because you whittle mm -hmm. it until you get the art piece. <laughs> so that was the most the challenge. Yeah. And what's next for you? What what's next? What other projects are you working on that you want to let us know about so we can keep following your uh, growing body of work as I mentioned to you when we first started? Because when we first started together you know, I, I had known you mostly for um, Yo Mama, and that was like the big <laughs> joke that we were talking about a while back. 
um, and, and how that story came to be. So you always have like really interesting ways that your, your, your stories come to be. So what else are you working on? Well, I have uh, actually the same date uh, that Best Belief releases, which is February 6th. And I'm excited about that very much so. Releasing in, I'm going to be in the Bronx. Yay. Um, with Elba, I hope. Um, Yay. That would be so Yeah. Cool. As much, <laughs> yeah. She just celebrated her 93rd birthday. So I'm really, really um, excited. Yeah. To show her this, to show her the book. But um, Relit, um, an anthology edited by Sandra uh, Proudman is coming out, and that book is 16 Latinx um, retellings of classic tales. So that's for our, our YA and our adults, mm -hmm. of course, right? And that, and in that anthology, um, I did a retelling of The Raven. Um, <gasps> and a sci fi. <laughs> yeah, sci fi. I love that. So, I'm ex I'm excited about I'm excited about that whole anthology. Um, it's coming together. So that's there's that. Um, and then, um, not announced yet, so I won't get too much into it, but there will be a novel uh, coming out in 2024. So look for that uh, announcement on the, you know, the, the heads, the PB, Publishers Weekly Heads. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so yeah, it's going to be an, it's going to be an exciting year. It sounds like it. And before we go, I, you know, I forgot to ask you which of the spreads were your favorite? I did tell you what mine was and you showed me what it was, but I want you to tell everyone what was your favorite spread and could you read a little bit of it for us? Okay. You send us off. So, <laughs> yes, I, so I had, a, as you know, I had a difficult time with this, but I will say um, one of my favorite spreads is of the sisters reunited together at the, at their, uh, uncle and aunt's house and they're celebrating and in this celebration which i'll hold up they're dancing and they're enjoying the music being played and it's just a moment of family and just a moment of joy and i and i only can imagine what that was like when they actually reunited so yeah. i will read here's the picture i love it Yes, and it's amazing because all these musicians you see in this picture are all really famous people. <laughs> I was like, how is this is real? <laughs> okay, so um, New Year's after Evelina's journey, she was joined in Harlem by Lillian, Elba, and Mommy. Life at the Goudreau residence was never lonely. After work, Theo would bring home treats, jokes, and stories. Elba loved him so much she called him Papi. And when Theo Hudro wasn't cooking up a storm in the kitchen, he was hustling to promote dancers, singers, and musicians. Imagine the sala galas at the apartamento de Theo Hudro. Songsters Bobby Capo and Machito singing Elba, Feliz Cumpleaños, the whole barrio surrounding her as she blew out the candles over a triple layer piscocho. And I guess I will stop there. <laughs> such a beautiful spread. Now, I'm going to guess when you show this book to Elba, that will probably be her best or her favorite page. Because that there's something so magical about that moment. And it's one of those moments where you're meeting family for the first time after having been separated for so long, it might be even emotional for her. So I don't know. I'm guessing that would probably be her spread. What do you think? Yeah, I think um, those moments that she described, there's so much going on in that apartment of hers that when I look at that spread myself, I, I see stories in every corner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, the little dog that's by the, the table of treats, yeah. she, that was really her dog and, and, some, and, and something I learned about by talking to her. Um, the musicians, I certainly looked up, but to hear her talk about them, being in, in the home and, and singing to them and just being um, part of the family. Um, oh, and just Elba talking about how her Theo was really, uh, you know, she was like her father figure and how she felt, she said, I, I quote, I, I felt spoiled. I would always just be curled up on his lap and, and, you know, and she just felt like she was so loved. And so, yeah, I, I, I imagine thank you to Nicole for capturing that. Right for capturing the 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 all that beautiful energy. Yeah, and we're 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 coming in 
to the end of the program. And I just wanted to ask you one last question, which is what is the biggest takeaway that you want people to have after reading Best Believe? The biggest takeaway is in the title. This book is about the readers believing in their own ancestry, their own roots, their own power, and our children believing and understanding that they deserve it all. They deserve opportunity. They deserve all the best books. They deserve great teachers who look like them and sound like them. And those are the things that the Tres Hermanas believed in. And we need to keep believing in ourselves and our, in our journey progressing to that point where we all have those things.